Welcome to the Better Together podcast, where we look for ways we can work together as Free Will Baptists to extend the work of Jesus Christ. Today we have Dr. Robert Pickrilly. He is like on the Better Together podcast. It feels like every other day to him, at least. But <laughs> he has been such a great contributor to our podcast, such a great contributor to Free Will Baptists, and really uh, Christians everywhere have benefited from his work. And so today, Dr. Pierre is going to talk to us about his book, Teacher, Leader, Shepherd, uh, the New Testament Pastor. So, Dr. Pickerly, thank you, my friend, for being back with us today. Thank you, Brother Eddie, for having me. I appreciate the opportunity. Well, we're glad that you're here. And, boy, I'm going to say I read this book a long time ago. We should say probably 14-year-old book, somewhere along in there. But it's a good textbook, and it's a good book that every pastor should read. And I would say even maybe some lay people to read to know what pastors do. What do you think about that? Well, I hadn't really thought about uh, (laughs) that, but uh, surely it would be a good idea for lay people to understand what's required of a pastor and what what a pastor ought to be and uh, then be able to give that kind of pastor their support. And I'd say it because we're dealing with a lot of churches today that don't have pastors, and I think it is helpful just to look at the criteria. We'll often refer them back to the biblical criteria, and that's really what you lay out in this book is the criteria, and you talk about the biblical terms for pastors in this book. Uh, Yeah. Uh, Basically, the book is uh, an exposition of scriptural passages that deal with the office of the pastor. Um, focusing on passages like 1 Timothy chapter 3, where the qualifications of the pastor are given, uh, as well as in Titus, uh, and in Paul's address to the Ephesian pastors in Acts chapter 20, and uh, other places in the New Testament as well, as in the last chapter of 1 Thessalonians, for example. So um, it's a book about what the Bible has to say. It's not a book about how to pastor. Mm -hmm. It's not a how-to book. Mm -hmm. It's not a book that uh, describes how to go about the work of of the pastorate, but it's a book about uh, what the New Testament expects the pastor to be and do. And uh, that's that's the main focus of it. That's good. And one of the things you talk about in the book is you just look at the Scripture and what it says about someone being called into the pastorate. And you say it's like a two-sided coin, really. Yeah, I think, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about the call to pastor. Um, and perhaps, uh, perhaps a lot of fellows out there are waiting for some kind of mystical experience that will bowl them over and they feel helpless to resist. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's really not what the call to the pastor is like. I think the call to preach Mm -hmm. on the one hand and the call to be a pastor of a particular church or at least to uh, have the pastoral role uh, is, is a twofold kind of thing. I think, first of all, there's the inner Uh, experience of the man who's being called by the Lord. And um, I think that inner experience uh, probably at least somewhere along the line results in a desire. Um, Paul says to Timothy, "If if a man desires the office of the bishop or overseer or pastor, he desires a good thing. Uh, So I think that the Holy Spirit deals with the individual Uh, on the inside and uh, provides a prompting Mm -hmm. uh, and suggests an ability, uh, an interest in the kind of things that pastors need to be interested in, such as Bible study and uh, teaching the scriptures and so on. So I think there's that that inner aspect to it, but I also think there's an external aspect uh, aspect to the call to the ministry, to the call to pastor, and that is in the church's recognition of the man's gifts and abilities and interests so that they see in him uh, the potential for being the pastor, the leader of a local church. So uh, I think it's uh, it's a two-sided kind of thing. Yeah, and you give an example of one of your mentors that uh, 
uh, he struggled a little bit with maybe the first part, but other people kind of pointed out they felt he was called or he should maybe look at that a little closer. Uh, yeah, I think you're referring to uh, Dr. L.C. Johnson, who wound up being the president of Free Will Baptist Bible College for many, many years and, as you say, certainly was a mentor of mine. I, I, I looked to him as a, uh, as a father figure in my own life, especially in my Christian life. Uh, Dr. Johnson didn't, didn't have any uh, strong experience that God had spoken to him uh, in the night or something like that and was compelling him against his will to be a preacher. Uh, he didn't have that kind of experience. But he, uh, he showed aptitude, uh, interest in the scriptures and in teaching the scriptures and in, in his care for people and that sort of thing. And uh, other preachers uh, around him began to notice the young man and his abilities and began to uh, ask him to come and to speak and uh, to suggest to him that he ought to seek ordination. Mm. In fact, my own experience was uh, a great deal like that. Uh, I was a student at the Bible College as a freshman uh, back in the fall of 1949, and uh, I certainly wasn't interested in being a preacher at that time, had no sense of that. Uh, I went to Bible college because my mom uh, sort of twisted my arm about going, and uh, so I went. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess other people began to uh, take note of uh, things that I was interested in, things that I could do. I certainly became interested in the scriptures and in uh, understanding the scriptures and in communicating that understanding to other people and folks began to notice that. So some of the older men around my home area in South Carolina began to encourage me to uh, consider being ordained for the ministry and uh, I was and I've never looked back on that or regretted that decision. But there I think again is that that twofold aspect of things, mm -hmm. the interest that's created within within the man himself and then the uh, observations of others in the church who recognize the gifts and the uh, abilities and the interests that uh, would qualify a man to be a pastor. That's good. And right now we have a major pastor shortage, uh, not just Free Will Baptist, but probably th a lot of denominations are experiencing that. And so I do wonder if sometimes we have not looked and identified and asked men to perform certain functions that would then feed this desire and help them to realize that maybe God is calling them into the ministry. Well, I think you're right. Um, I think all of us are familiar with uh, one of our leaders in the denomination who uh, ultimately became the director of the home missions department, uh, Tryman Messer, mm -hmm. who in a sense never uh, thought that he was called in a traditional sense to preach, but uh, because of his interests and abilities, people kept uh, uh, asking him to do this or that, and he became a pastor, and he became a leader uh, within the denomination. I really think that within the life of a local church, uh, if God gifts young men within that church or a young man within that church uh, with those kinds of interests and abilities that um, are important for the work of a pastor, that it, uh, it, behooves, the, uh, it behooves them, the other members of that local church, to uh, begin to speak to the young man. Young man, you have gifts. You have interests. You ought to consider doing this and give him an opportunity to teach and to develop the gifts that God has given him. Um, I really think that in one sense, it may be that the best source of a church uh, for a pastor is from within that church's own midst, yes. although it's not limited to that, but that would often be a very good source for a pastor of a local church. Mm -hmm. And really, that's probably the natural, the way it would naturally be. I think so, yes. So we encourage all our listeners to think about that. Look at within your church, potential pastors, and pray about that and encourage them to look at that as well.
I think about the end of your book, you say what the, you talk about the qualifications that pastor must have qualifications or in other words things that would disqualify someone from being a pastor right and then you get into a bit of but the scripture doesn't say that some of these other things are required um which is kind of interesting because it's an assumption isn't it that they would do those things yes um the qualifications or disqualifications that uh, I deal with in the book are based on the passage in 1 Timothy chapter 3 as well as what uh, the passage in Titus chapter 1 adds to that. Um, but it doesn't say, for instance, that a man must be a man of prayer, or it doesn't say that a, a man must be a man who studies the Bible, reads the Bible carefully, and masters the Scriptures, because that's what all Christians ought to do. Uh, so certainly a man who's going to be a, a pastor uh, will lead by example in the basic qualifications for uh, the practice of Christianity, for being a good Christian, uh, as, uh, of course, he should be. So that um, uh, the, the pastor ought to spend a great deal of time in the study. Mm -hmm. uh, after all, the pastor is primarily a teacher. In Ephesians, when the, the gifts of the Spirit are listed in Ephesians, the last one is the pastor who is a teacher. Um, the term pastor represents his name from the analogy of the sheep and the shepherd because the word pastor simply means a shepherd. Uh, but the teacher represents the uh, pastor's role in terms of what his main work is. He's a teacher, a teacher of the Word of God. Well, obviously, you can't be a good teacher if you're not a good student. Mm. So you've got to study the Scriptures first. Uh, every, every pastor ought to be spending hours every week in the study, uh, mastering the Scriptures. And out of that study will grow the, the uh, sermons that he needs to preach to and to teach his people in the Christian life. And the same is true for prayer. Mm -hmm. uh, the pastor's got to be a man of prayer because he his prayer expresses his need for God and his sense of dependence on God and his seeking for God's help and leadership in his work. And so he certainly needs to spend time uh, in the prayer closet, as the, the old folks used to say, <laughs> Uh, dealing with God and seeking God's leadership and help in understanding as well as in his help in communicating his understanding to others. That's great. And so really we want to, as a pastor, kind of come back and look at the qualifications, look at what disqualifies us, look at the characteristics we must have and focus on that. But it is an outgrowth. You mentioned at the end what you just said of that daily time with the, the Lord, daily time talking to Him, that's what feeds the call and helps us to be the kind of pastor God wants us to be. Absolutely. And those qualifications in 1 Timothy are really, really quite important. Mm -hmm. If you put 1 Timothy and Titus together, and if I remember the numbers correctly at the moment, there's about 16 mm -hmm. things listed in yeah. those passages. Some of them are positive qualifications. In other words, you must be this. Others are negative, and I call them disqualifications. You must not be this. And uh, those qualifications need a great deal of attention uh, in the life. They're the kinds of things that uh, a person begins the ministry with some level of them, but ought to improve them along as he goes. Uh, and to develop them even further uh, in his life as a pastor. And then we think about presbytery boards. Uh, they have a pretty important function, and really it's their ex the expectation that they would know this and are looking for this and searching for this as they examine men who are called into the ministry. Yeah, absolutely. I've, I've known... Um, I've known too many instances of uh, the ordaining councils or boards of presbytery, whatever terminology you want to use, for those who actually have the responsibility to examine and decide about the ordination of, uh, of a given man 
who's presented to them. And I've known of too many instances, as I say, where it's a matter that all they do is, is uh, listen to the man's testimony and decide, yeah, he really does sound like he's called to preach, so let's ordain him. That's really not adequate at all. It's the church's responsibility to be very careful in the process of ordaining men to the ministry. And those qualifications are uh, the top things they ought to be looking at uh, in uh, deciding about the ordination of a man to the ministry. I wish every ordaining council in our denomination would require every candidate for ordination to read this little book uh, because it, as I say, provides the biblical basis for the ordination of a man to be a pastor. It's probably a good book. I hope the ordination council members read it as well. But yeah. just before you go in to meet with the candidate, it's probably a good idea just to review some of the things and, and keep in mind, you know, that's what where our questions and uh, what we're looking at when we talk to a person. Exactly. And you, you mentioned earlier about the laity of the church reading the book. That wouldn't hurt either. I think it would help the laity appreciate what kind of responsibilities, uh, oftentimes burdensome responsibilities, at least they can be in various circumstances, but what the responsibilities of the pastor really are, as well as what the qualifications are, so that they'll call to the pastorate of their church a person who uh, meets the qualifications, at least at the uh, entry level. <clears throat> yeah, that's great. Well. Dr. Piccarelli, thank you for taking the time to be with us today, and thank you for taking the time to write this book uh, a few years back, but it's still very useful. This does not change. The content is the same, and we need to focus on it today just like we did yesterday. Thank you very much for having me. And thank you all for listening. We want to encourage you to share, like if you're watching on Facebook, this podcast with others. That would be helpful. And remember... Everything we do, we're able to accomplish more. We truly are better when we work together. Thank you for joining us today.